almost every week in this congregation, people hand to me and to Pastor Emily prayer requests, and they're often for healing. And then a few minutes later, it is left to the ministers, usually Pastor Emily, except for once a month, to parse and frame that request into a public prayer, and it has to happen very quickly. How we pray depends on what you wrote. If the request is simple and we don't know a lot of the details about the extent of the person's illness, then we might be brave enough to pray for healing. But if you tell us that the person is gravely ill, then our job is harder. We try to balance a vigorous, rigorous faith in God with the realities of life as we know it. And in that case, we might use vague words like comfort, peace, companionship, love. It seems like we're hedging our bets. It seems like we're letting God off the hook. We're not asking God to do anything out of the ordinary, which begs the question, at least for me, then how do we know that God is involved at all? Are prayers for healing just wishful thinking? Are they ways that we make ourselves feel better, as if we've actually done something for the sick person? A few weeks ago, at the Big Supper Summit, hosted by the Chairs of Worship, Nurture, and Mission, healing was something that many of you wanted to hear more about. You expressed a desire for healing to be highlighted in worship, nurture, and mission. So it seems to me that despite our mis givings about it, we still desire on some primal level for God to enter the scene in our lives, in the lives of people we love, and to heal, to fix what is broken. In all four Gospels, Jesus' fame spread because people knew he was a healer. That's his primary identity for most folks. These healings, however, were not an end unto themselves. Instead, the healings gathered people in and made them pay attention so that when Jesus spoke about the reign of God, he had their attention. But those two things, healing and proclamation, actually go hand in hand. And the followers of Jesus, i.e. all of us and all the rest of the Christians in the world, we are supposed to continue the work that Jesus began. Now we're okay with the proclamation part, if nothing else, you hire a couple of ministers to do that bit. But what of the healing aspect of his ministry? How do we carry that on? In last week's Gospel lesson, a man with an unclean spirit confronted Jesus in the synagogue, and Jesus spoke to the man and the spirit and set the poor man free. And we pick up today immediately where we left off last week. Simon and Andrew, new disciples of Jesus, invited Jesus to go to Simon's house, and they didn't have to travel very far. Archaeologists believe they have found the remains of Simon Peter's house right next door to the ancient synagogue. It actually shares a wall. Simon, whom we know better as Peter, had a mother-in-law who lived in that house along probably with the extended family, and she was very sick with a fever. That's usually not such a big deal for us. Sometimes we even still go to work. We take a couple of Advil and off we go. But in the ancient world, a fever was an indication often that somebody was gravely ill. There are no antibiotics, and so simple things killed people, and fevers frightened people. 
The house, I imagine, was filled with fear. Simon urged Jesus to go see her, hoping vaguely that maybe Jesus, the healer, could do something to help her. Now, the Gospel of Mark is known for its brevity, its conciseness, its lack of detail, and that is evident in this story. All Mark says is that Jesus entered the room. And Mark never tells us what this woman's name was. And if Jesus said anything to her to greet her that day, it is not recorded here. But this we know. Jesus walked up to her head, leaned down, took her by the hand, and lifted her up. He touched her. Jesus touched her, and that touch apparently was enough to drive out the fever and restore her to health and her place in the household, her dignity, her worth. Jesus touched her. When I was a kid growing up in church, we used to sing this Gaither song over and over again called, He Touched Me. The refrain is like this, speaking of Jesus. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. We used to love him. Jesus' touch was somehow a conduit for the power of God. And according to scripture and some modern research, so is our touch. Touch therapy has been studied for quite a long time now, and the results of some of those studies are quite amazing. Touch therapy has been shown to have quantifiable benefits for those suffering from asthma and high blood pressure and migraines and childhood di diabetes. The research also suggests that human touch, simple touch, can actually boost our immune system and slow or in some cases even halt the progress of a disease. More specific to the topic at hand for a group of Christians, in one of these studies, another group of Christians prayed for sick people all the way on the other side of the United States. And interestingly enough, not much changed for the sick people on the other side of the United States. But when those same Christians prayed for people in their own town whom they actually went to visit and touched, there were appreciable differences in how quickly the sick people recovered. Jesus touched her. Now, I don't mean to imply, as some of my colleagues might, that all Jesus did was use a little touch therapy on a mildly feverish woman. The Gospels are clear and unapologetic in their claim that Jesus had extraordinary powers to heal. But what I do mean to imply is that for those of us who follow him, who long for these words to be true, who long to do the works that he did, we too might be able to access God's restorative power with something as simple and common and lacking in our world as human touch. UCC clergy are required in the New York Conference to take periodic boundary awareness training. The last time I did, I was astounded, really astounded, to hear that we pastors should never be touching any of you parishioners without your express permission. That means that each time I shake your hand or give you a hug or a peck on the cheek, I should ask first. Can you imagine how much longer the passing of the peace will be? <laughs> now, I do not mean 
to disparage appropriate boundaries. God knows they have been abused in the church. And I do not mean that anyone in this room or any other place should ever feel forced or coerced into touching anybody else. But we lose something very powerful when we stop touching one another. Jesus touched her, which also had its own boundary issues. She was a woman, and he was an unrelated male, so the law forbade touching. His touch was forbidden. She had fever. That fever made her ritually unclean, so his touch was forbidden. Jesus took her hand and lifted her up on the Sabbath. That lifting was work, making the touch forbidden. Be that as it may, for Jesus, human restoration and human dignity and human wholeness always trumped the rules. He was absolutely consistent in that. In his book, Moral Lessons Notes on the Art of Surgery, Dr. Richard Selzer has written of the miraculous healing possibilities of human touch. He writes, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted, palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth has been severed, to remove a tumor in her cheek, I had to do that. The young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. He bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close that I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers to show her that their kiss still works. And I hold my breath and let the wonder sink in. I suppose that that woman's face was never healed in any dramatic fashion. But she was made whole. That kiss that touch made love incarnate to her. That's why Jesus came into the world. And that is why he sends us out 